We are really far into our very, very slow journey through Hebrews 11, which is sometimes called the Hall of Faith, and I like to call the Hall of Heroes. So last Sunday, John talked to us about unlikely paths that God has us on. So you know God has each of us on a faith journey, and no two journeys look alike. And it means that we're going to have to try stuff. We're going to have to do something. We're going to have to put one foot in front of the other, even when it's hard, painful, or uncomfortable. And so, like John said last week, not trying is not really an option. So last week's scripture talked about an unlikely path that God made for his people right through the middle of a sea. Now this morning we're going to discover yet another kind of unlikely path and another unlikely hero. So our key scriptures today are in the book of Hebrews, like I said, but we'll be visiting several other books of the Bible. And all the scriptures I'm reading today come from the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV. So today's verses are just two verses in chapter 11 of Hebrews, verses 30 and 31. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. So I love alliteration. I can't apologize for that. So today we're going to meet four words beginning with the letter W. So your job is to pay attention to when I get to the next W word. So the first one is walls. So did you know that this was new to me, that the city of Jericho, which is now situated in Palestine on the West Bank, is considered the oldest city in the world? I did not know that. If you Google oldest city in the world. Hopefully that same answer will pop up on your phone. It is also the city with the oldest known protective wall, which was built around 8,000 BC. Now the events we're going to look at today occurred much more recently, a mere 3,400 years ago, approximately 1400 BC, just to get the time period in our heads. So that old protective city wall was between five and six and a half feet thick and 12 to 17 feet high. I know these are just numbers, but it's kind of like I'm just trying to give us a visual for what we're talking about here. It was, it served a defensive purpose as well as protecting the city from floods. Now, for comparison purposes, a much more recent wall that we all know about, the Berlin Wall, was 3.9 feet thick and 12 feet tall which means that our ancient wall around Jericho, which was built about 10,000 years ago, was about twice as thick as the Berlin Wall. And I'm like, that's pretty impressive wall building, don't you think? So our first verse in Hebrews says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, I love taking detours, you know that. So I was like, well, how does, how, does, how does a city wall get encircled? Well, it happens when somebody starts where they are. <laughs> they take one foot, put it in front of the other foot, and repeat until they've walked around the entire circumference of the city. So a story. So our family was recently at our son Peter's wedding, and one, on one of our many airport runs, Uh, for various family members, several of us got to visit the old town of Dubrovnik, which has walls that are triple the thickness of our Jericho walls. And because we had just a couple of hours, we did a very quick, unplanned walk inside the city. We actually tried to encircle the city. We tried to go around the walls. But, and I know this sounds really silly, we couldn't figure out how to get to the edge. (laughs) There were homes and businesses tucked into every nook and cranny of every wall, every lane, every staircase, you name it. So cities with walls around them tend not to be built on flat ground in convenient, regular, concave shapes. It was incredibly difficult to find the city's boundaries. We climbed up and down countless steps, 
and turned many corners, often thinking we finally reached the edge of the city, only to discover there was more. And many more corners we turned led only to dead ends. Another unlikely journey. It was reasonably fun for a few hours, but nowhere near the simple walk we'd imagined it would be. So back to our story, the walls of Jericho, they fell, how? All we are told is after those walls had been encircled for seven days, the walls fell by faith. Now we're not given comprehensive explanations of everything in the Bible, nor our, or anywhere in life, period, nor are we promised them. We are told that things happen when we put faith in God into action. So the account, oh, I do, I do want to just point this out because this particular story is a stumbling block for many people, including some that are probably in this room or some listening to my voice. The account of the fall of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6 is admittedly a very difficult story for us to understand. And for most people, it raises more questions than answers. Theologians have debated these things for centuries, so I want to acknowledge the tensions in this story and at the same time glean some treasures that are within. All right, so we're reading about a particular set of walls in a particular city at a particular time in history. It is a historical story. But the writer of Hebrews draws our attention to it in order to emphasize that this was no ordinary story. It was by faith that these walls fell. All right, so that's a little intro about walls. Our next W is weariness. Now, peeking ahead to what follows our Hall of Heroes, if we look at the beginning of chapter 12 of Hebrews, and of course, there were no chapter divisions when the, the writer wrote this down. That's just for our convenience. It starts with these, these verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary in your souls or lose heart. So I wonder... What walls are we up against in our lives that are making us worn out or weary? We all tend to get cluttered up in our minds sometimes with walls that obscure our view of who God is and what he's doing. Sometimes we're hanging on to old thought patterns. Sometimes we have fresher misunderstandings. Sometimes we borrow from the difficulties of others. We probably get some of these walls from the news or from social media, which are not the best sources for the abundant life. So when these things happen, when we become aware of them, we can remember Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So God is continually inviting us to lift up our eyes above the walls that we can see to him, above the thoughts in our minds, above the noise, above our circumstances. And I don't know about you, but I, as much as I hope for simple or as we hope for simple in our lives, doesn't life tend to be complicated? And as much as we tend to hope for predictable doesn't life seem to tuck in ever more surprises? Some of them welcome, some not so much. And I know we all tend to hope for the comfortable, but life seems to have a way of wearing away at our bodies, our minds, our hearts. Are you weary? I want to encourage you, lift up your eyes 
off of the walls in your life and look at God. He is with you. He is for you. He is able. He is good. And that brings us to our third W. That's welcome. So now we're going to the second verse. And a couple of people asked me this week, so what are you going to be talking about on Sunday? And I, I was like, well, there's just these two verses. It's almost like it's two completely separate stories, even though it's in the same location. So the next verse goes on to focus on a single person in the city of Jericho. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. So we're told that Joshua, whom God commissioned as Moses' successor in leading the people of Israel into the promised land, Joshua saved one person in the entire city along with all who belonged to them. Now, if you heard of a city where a leader selected one person to spare along with all who belonged to them, what kind of person would you expect that to be? The head of government? A person of wealth? A military leader? A cultural hero? A man? Okay, in the shame-honor culture in which this story is set, shockingly, Joshua chose someone who clearly occupied the lowest rung of society, the lowest shame rung, if you think of a ladder with honor up here and shame down at the bottom. So in this kind of culture, it doesn't matter what this person has said or done. Their words and actions tend not to register, no matter how kind or good they've been. They tend to be overlooked in every setting particularly places of power. So let's meet our unlikely hero and pick up the story. So Hebrews 11 is kind of like a, oh, here's, here's somebody you should know about. And so we need to go back to the book of Joshua to find out more about this hero. This is in chapter 2 of Joshua, starting in the first verse. Then Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and spent the night there. The king of Jericho was told, some Israelites have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the whole land. But the woman took the two men and hid them. So I'm going to skip down to verse 8. Before they went to sleep, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that dread of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no courage left in any of us because of you. Now let's notice, how is Rahab described here? We're only told two things. She was a woman, and she was a prostitute. First century historian Josephus adds that she was also an innkeeper, an unsurprising detail, as it was not uncommon for both an inn and a brothel to operate within the same building. We are not given any further details about the spies other than that they entered her house and spent the night there. We do know that somehow Rahab had heard of the Lord and what he had done, Now, I don't think it automatically follows that it was easy for Rahab to show kindness to these men. By definition, a prostitute is someone who exchanges sexual activity for payment. Prostitution offered no protections for those whose livelihood depended on it. Chances are Rahab had been used and abused by numerous men. Chances are she had grown accustomed to being treated as an object. 
chances are she was more or less invisible in the eyes of others. So on this particular day, she was going about her usual routines when God interrupted her with a divine duty, some heavenly homework, a mystical mission. God called forth the unlikely hero from within. She responded with a yes in her heart and actions to back that up. So as she put her faith in the Lord into action, God used her to set others free and to change the course of history. God called Rahab to welcome the stranger in her life. God called Joshua to welcome Rahab and all who belonged to her. And just like he did then, God is continually calling and inviting us to welcome another. And often he takes us, he interrupts us and takes us out of our comfort zones to do so. And that brings us to our last W, wholeheartedness. <laughs> I tried to get a shorter word that couldn't find one. There's one more small detail tucked into our scripture today that I'd like to focus on for just a minute. Again, I'll read that second verse. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. So we know that she welcomed the spies, but more than that, she welcomed them in peace. So the Greek word here refers to the wholeness that comes only when all essential parts are joined together. The verb here indicates that she received and welcomed these strangers with a high level of self-involvement. She didn't just toss them a few scraps. She invested herself wholeheartedly with a high level of self-involvement in welcome, welcoming them as they were, in helping them in their distress. She acknowledged God's sovereignty and character and put her faith in his unchanging nature and then did something to back that up. The result? They made a kind of conditional treaty of kindness with one another, which we read about again in Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 11, where Rahab said, The Lord your God is indeed God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, since I have dealt kindly with you, swear to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal kindly with my family. Give me a sign of good faith that you will spare my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, Our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of yours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Now, Rahab's mentioned again in the, gospel, in the um, letter by the Apostle James when he explains further how Rahab's faith and actions worked together. This is in chapter 2, beginning at verse 14 of the book of James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from works and I by my works will show you faith. Down to verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So, faith without works is also dead. So what ended up happening to Rahab anyway? The story continues in Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day when this was written down because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And then stunningly, we see Rahab one more in one more very significant place in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 1, also known as the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, Rahab's name appears as a direct ancestor of Jesus Christ. And I bet nobody in Rahab's day saw that one coming. So what does all this mean for us today? We've talked about walls. We've talked about weariness. We've talked about welcome. And we've talked about wholeheartedness. There are all kinds of reasons why we might study a passage of scripture like Hebrews 11. And one of the reasons I think God gives us so many unlikely heroes in scripture and in church history is so that we might learn to imitate their faith and their lives. So I've prepared four reflection questions for us to consider. And I would like for us to make room right now to hold these questions and what the Lord is speaking to our hearts, to hold these in the light of his presence. So would you pray with me and then I'll lead us through a time with a lot of space in it. So we're going to just sit before the Lord and just listen. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would give us the grace to notice what you want to say to us today. We want to set aside anything that is keeping us from the fullness of life and the freedom that you desire for each one of us. Help us to hear your invitation today. Still our thoughts. Still our hearts. Still our bodies to listen well to you and to receive the good gifts you want to give us. So the first reflection question, which walls in my life are looming large, possibly blocking my view of God's goodness, presence, or power? Can I trust you, God, for the perspective, wisdom, and direction I need today? The second reflection question, in what areas am I experiencing weariness, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, in the places where my body, my heart, or my mind has been worn away? Can I rest in and receive the Lord's healing, restoration, and timing? The third reflection question, who would the Lord like for me to welcome today as an unlikely hero? Have I disqualified myself or someone else because they seem too unlikely to be a hero that God would use to set others free 
and change the course of history. And then a final reflection question. In whom does the Lord want me to invest wholeheartedly with a high level of self-involvement to welcome them as they are, to help them in their distress? So, Lord, as we hold all of these ponderings before you, we just ask that you would help us to hear your words of life, your words of invitation. We just lean into you, Jesus. We thank you that you are always with us, that you never leave us, You never forsake us, no matter what is swirling around outside of us. All we have to do is incline our our head just to lean into you, just to breathe in more of you, to breathe out the things that keep us from experiencing your abundant life. We love you so very much, and we ask that you would just help us to stay present in the present with you, in the presence of the Lord, every moment of every day. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.